In today's video, we're going to pick up on the interview with Ernie Emerson of Emerson Knives. And we're going to talk more about the story of the company, of where it started, and what it's become. So anyway, this, when I was talking about the commander knife, I just wanted to show you, this was the commander knife, and you can see it had the wave. So this, this knife called the commander was the, the knife that I was working on at that time for uh, the guys. And uh, so this, this was the actual first knife that actually had a wave feature on it. Now, do these come like in smaller versions also? They come in bigger versions and smaller versions. Because I could see, you know, I, I don't carry my full size 1911 because it's just too big. Oh, yeah. But a compact will yeah. go anywhere. Well, you know, again, it depends on. Uh, well, here's an interesting thing that you bring that up. You can't, you can't carry your full size 1911 uh, at certain times. But you've got the compact. Why do you have the compact? So you can carry a gun with you all of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's also an important thing that a lot of people don't understand about a concealed carry permit or knives or anything like that. Because, you know, what's your fighting knife? Well, it's the knife you have on you if you ever got into a fight, I guess. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter what it is at that point. The one I have on me. There you go, yeah. exactly. So, you know, you, you need to build, uh, for example, uh, Let's go there for a minute. Guys uh, would, would build knives for police officers. I build a police knife. Look at it. It's a big Bowie knife with, you know, it's got a, it's got a badge in it, you know, a star, you know, on Mar U.S. Marshal. It's 14 inches long and blah, 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 blah. I made it for my buddy. He's a cop. And so it's like, this is the ultimate police knife. Okay. Well, where does that knife go? It goes on the mantle yeah, or yeah. in the safe. It's the same thing, too. You have to make uh, a tool that is going to be the one, no matter who it is, that they would feel comfortable having it with them all of the time. And you may have one that you carry on duty, whether it's a, a, a smaller fixed blade or a full-size gun or whatever that the case may be, but you also have to have the option to have the whatever it is when you're out jogging or you're you know going to the movies or the, out to dinner with your wife and where you're not in you know, tactical gear. Where you're still invisible. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, we, we generally make a, sometimes there's four versions, depending on the popularity of the knife and all that, but we make a small, medium, and large because, again, it just depends. And, and me being not, not a big guy, uh, I'm more in that medium range because, you know, it's got to fit in your pocket, and it doesn't, you can't feel like it weighs 22 pounds, you know, because... You've got you to be able to carry it and want to yeah, carry it. Yeah, you're going to take it out and not bring it with you. And, and, then, and like a good CCW, you want to forget you're wearing it. Absolutely. And uh, so anyway, yes, we do make, we make various sizes of them. Um, I, I have to say that the, the CQC-7 and the Commander are still uh, neck and neck for probably the, the best-selling knives that we've ever made. They still are our probably number one selling knives. So, and, and I can uh, see that. I mean, um, I prefer, you know, a spear point or a Bowie more than necessarily a Tonto, mm -hmm. just because I haven't spent much time with a Tonto. But yeah. I know it's very much a dedicated fighting knife. But, like, also when I go to work, I have to open boxes. So I'm looking at for an all-around knife. Well, that's what most people... Um, that, that's actually the, the goal is to build an all-around knife that fits into all categories. Because again, that is the knife you will have all the time. And, uh, you know, the tactical knives, uh, again, let's say that seven, that might be a knife someone clips in their gear or puts in their pocket, uh, you know, their cargo pants or whatever when they, when they go on duty. It may not necessarily be the knife that they would want to carry uh, when they're in a mixed crowd, let's just say, where, yeah. where you know, because not everybody's a tactical person or, and, you know, whatever. And that's whatever. Steve's, which is one of his prized possessions. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a 15. And that is, that is, I believe, a, uh, that might be a mini 15, isn't it? Yeah. So that, that actually is a knife that we have uh, that, it's, it's funny you bring this one up, because it, this knife has the, 
the curved belly. And, and I noticed that right away. I mean, that curved belly is such a beautiful design. And the Tonto Point. So what I did to create this knife is I married these two blade styles. So you start to see the, uh, the development, yeah. It's funny. One thing leads to another. It's, it's like a evolutionary... Uh, I think uh, you'll probably want that knife back, branch, though. Yeah. <laughs> this one's been sharpened a little bit. He, he was tell. telling me that you guys have got a great um, program where you guys sharpen knives for life. And I can yeah. see where if you've got a chisel point, that's almost something you have to throw in as part of the customer service. Well, you know, it's true. But I, I will tell you something. Uh, and this, this is a... Um, this is one of those things, a point I would really like to make, actually, because I don't get a chance to talk to a lot of people, uh, but being on your show, uh, hopefully it'll be to more than just the people in the room, so to speak. Do not mystify the sharpening of your knife. You can sharpen a knife. You can sharpen a chisel grind. You can sharpen a, a V grind. You can sharp, sharpen an apple seed grind. You can sharpen a convex or a concave or a hollow grind. I'll tell you a little story. Here's, here's the deal. Nobody could sharpen a knife like my grandpa. He was the best knife sharpener that there ever was. I mean, his knives were razor sharp. I could see him shave his hair with it. Well, think about, think about that. There was a guy my age with an eight-year-old boy. I'm his grandpa. I, sh I had the sharpest knives that ever existed on the planet Earth. <laughs> no one could ever sharpen like Before my grandpa. Before you can shave, you That's can shave. Right. <laughs> We have a tendency, because I think almost all of us have been there, whether it's your dad or your brother or uncle or whatever, so we think, oh my gosh, at, when you're 8 or 10 years old, it is the sharpest knife that ever existed on the planet Earth, and we lock that in, and it's like, I'll never be able to make a knife as sharp as my grandpa or, or whoever. So we, we tend to say sharpening knives is an art. It's, it's the magic. Oh, man, that guy knows how to sharpen. No, you, everyone can learn how to sharpen a knife. I have, there's, there's 10 million people out there that make an, can make a knife sharper than I can make a knife. We'll sharpen them for you. I got it. Sometimes people don't have the time and or the stuff to do it. But uh, don't ever sell yourself short. You can sharpen that knife as sharp as your grandfather's knife. It's just that when you have the eyes of a little child. I still have my grandpa's Swiss Army knife. <laughs> and every time I open that up, it's like, i got to be really careful with this Because it's sharp. Because I've cut myself so many times on this little Swiss Army well, knife. Well, maybe your grandpa and, was that guy. And I never seem to learn. It's like, yeah, yeah. <sighs> but anyway, again, it's, it's, you know, if I can do it, Believe me, I'm an average guy. If I can do it, then everybody else Dude, can do it. Dude, you do not come off to me as an well, average guy it, by a long I, shot. You know, I want to thank be you for the compliment. Like you are. <laughs> thank you, but I really am. And if you talk to my wife, I'm, <laughs> I'm nowhere near average. <laughs> she is a, uh, she's my harshest critic, my, my biggest supporter. And uh, I'll tell you, when I came home, I was a, I was a uh, tool and die maker uh, at Hughes Aircraft. Yeah. And uh, had a really nice job. It was, a, it was actually one of those dream jobs because I, I worked in a kind of a skunk works uh, area and we had a completely open budget. It was a black budget, so there was no, we could do anything we wanted. So if you could think of something. If you're wondering where um, those $300 toilets were going, yeah. yeah. We were part of that. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't have anything to do with designing them. But uh, where I'm going with it is, I had that job, full benefits, everything. I mean, how many pair of glasses do I need a year? How many fillings do I need? You know, well, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it You're was set. all, everything was paid for. And I came home one day uh, after I was making these knives for a while, and I said, honey, I think, uh, I think I could make it as a knife maker. And she was like, what? No, no way, no way on earth that you You've got a job that you will retire from. And her dad was a uh, machinist for Northrop, so uh, she had grown up in an environment where you always had, um, you had a nice life uh, because it was a steady job. And I said, no, I think I can. So we had some heart-to-heart -heart talks, and finally she said, well, if you think you can really do this, I'm up for it. And I said, I, I really do. And it was a huge leap of faith to go from, you know, it, at that time, I think I was making sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year, uh, and that was in nineteen, probably nineteen 
probably 1982 or 1983. Life good. I had a good life. I mean, I could buy new cars and everything else. And uh, to give that up, but I had a, I, I just had that dream or that drive to, you know, I, I, I know I could do this. And, and it, it would take a nuclear detonation to stop me from, from getting where I was going. And uh, luckily she said, yes, let's give it a try. And so we've never looked back. And uh, for many, many years I built custom knives. And then uh, after our, our roller coaster ride with uh, Benchmade and everything and having them uh, define to me that there's more people out there that want Emerson knives than I was aware of. Uh, I remember Les saying, Ernie, we can't be, we can't be the Emerson Knife Company because I kept, here's another design, here's another one I made, here's some other prototypes. John Browning did the same thing. Yeah, I was like, what am I going to do? And I said, I have to have my own knife company. That's the only way I can do this. And so in 1997, uh, we actually incorporated and formed uh, Emerson Knives and went into a production type mode. Now we still, at that time when I started the company, I had everything made and because at that time there was a ton of machine shops and a ton of uh, grinding shops and that all over uh, the Los Angeles, California greater area because there was Northrop, Boeing, Douglas, Hughes Aircraft, TRW, there were thousands of shops everywhere. And more importantly, soon to be surplus machinery. Yeah, and that was, I, I, I benefited from that. But at the time, I was able to have all of my parts made, and then we just assembled them. Because I didn't, I was still in my house. But here's a funny thing. My, uh, my daughter was very good friends with a, uh, a little gal that lived down the street, who we became very good friends with. And he was a bishop in the Mormon church. And so when we started the company, uh, I went to him, because they were good friends of ours, and I said, uh, I know you guys have a giant support group for all of the, your, you know, the people in need in, in your community, in your church and everything. Do you have any m mothers, moms, uh, that need to, need to work, but they have kids that are in school or not, so they have to be able to go and get them. I said, I'm willing to work flexible hours. Do you have any people that need a job? And uh, he was actually a police chief in Hermosa Beach at the time. And he said, uh, I do. So I said, well, come on, let's have, those, let's have those ladies put knives together. So here's the funny thing. Every morning for about a year and a half, almost two years, four or five young, young moms, young ladies, would come to our door at about 7.30 in the morning and then go into our house and then leave in the afternoon. And I always thought, I wonder what the neighbors Anybody think watching is, go is going on in head. there. But we would set up uh, uh, picnic tables, not picnic tables, uh, cough, uh, card tables. We'd set those up in the living room. I'd get all the boxes out that would come via UPS and all that, for, or we'd go and drive up and get the heat-treated blades or whatever. And bring them on home lay them all out every morning. The gals would come in, drink some coffee, and then put knives together all day long. And uh, Mary would work on the computer and all that. So we, we, we started that company uh, in that manner. And I was very lucky because um, the, there was a big company called uh, Blue Ridge Knives. Yeah. And they uh, distributed it to all the mom and pop knife stores and gun stores all over the United States. And I became good friends with them uh, be before then, and they they came to me when I started my company, and they said, Ernie, we'll take every single knife. We'll buy every knife. We'll take you all the knives you make. And I was like, I looked at my wife, and I was like, holy smokes, that's, that's awesome. Because all I need to do is make them. I don't have to go out and... Try and convince people to buy them. They're, somebody else doing They're the going to do the all that. Yeah. So it was a. It was one of those things where I was like, God, how lucky. How lucky am I? And how lucky can one guy be? You know, I mean, it was like. So anyway, long story. Uh, they they took all the knives uh, for quite a while, a couple of years, and then distributed them to all the. So it was kind of like I didn't have to go out and convince somebody that that they needed an Emerson knife. All I needed to work on was getting the improving my ability to make them and, and, and put them together and, and get them out there. So that's, uh, 
basically led us to two or three years later renting our first uh, place, uh, which is another <laughs> another story about my wife. Um, in order to make the knives, we needed to buy the the uh, equipment which was CNC mills and grinding machines and grinding sanding machines and every kind of thing you could think of. A typical machine shop. But the heart and soul of what we were doing required a laser. Uh, and it was a Mitsubishi laser. And, you know, you can go out and buy a Bridgeport mill for, you know, a used one, you can buy for a couple thousand dollars. You could even buy a used CNC mill for $15,000. Those are palatable prices. Can't go out and buy used lasers at that time. So I went, I went to Mary and I said, honey, I said, you know that nice house you want? I got to buy a laser to make this company work because that's the only way we can have control over what I want to be able to do. And she said, well, how much is it? And I said, honey, you know that how, nice house you wanted? That laser is $476,000. And she was like, wow, that is a house. And I said, yeah, that's a real nice house. But I said, hopefully that will be able to get us to buy a nice house a couple of years down the road. It's a long way from a 20 by 30 cabin. Oh, God, a hell of a long way. Um, but she really has been, without her, I wouldn't have the, I wouldn't have the company. Because um, without her um, faith in me, because that's what it also took, was I needed someone to say, yeah, you can do this, Ernie. You know, go for it. But don't, but don't you look back. Oh, yeah, don't cause, you cause self -doubt hesitate. Because self-doubt is such a killer. Yeah. She said, I'm, you know, you're going to do this. And I said, honey, I am going to do and, this. And there to make you follow through with Damn it. Damn straight. And so uh, she, she bought into my dream and... Uh, it worked out in the end. It's it's she still works. She's down the hall doing work right now. Of course, my daughter is is uh, Rachel is in. Uh, she's head of operations. She got her degree in uh, uh, manufacturing operations. My daughter Megan is over there. She's head of all marketing and and uh, advertising and all that. And so it is still. Um, it's not our living room anymore. But my family's still around me every single day of the week. And it's funny because. Um, People said, how do you, you're with your wife all the time. And I said, yeah, I'm with my wife 24-7. There's not, there's not 10 minutes we're away from each other uh, uh, per year. And how can you do that? And I, and I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. People have asked me, except that uh, we are, we are um, you remember the movie or the TV show with the, uh, the Duck Dynasty guys? They'd have those contrived... Uh, crises and all that, and then at the end of the day, they'd all sit down at the dinner table, and and everybody would be good again and all that. We live that. That is our family. We fight like cats and dogs. It, it's slamming doors and everything else sometimes here in the shop. That's real life. You know? But when we go home at night, none of that, none yeah. of that exists. Just leave it all in the field. Yeah, and so that is how we've been able to maintain this relationship. And my wife and I just had our 40th anniversary last summer. Congratulations. Summer. Thank you. Uh, and we're still, we still enjoy each other's company. <laughs> I mean, at least I think we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, every day I get up and say a prayer because 12 years later, my wife still likes me. Yeah. And look, it, you have no idea what she has to put up with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a feel for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But same thing, with, without my wife, I, I couldn't do what I do. No, no. And uh, that old story about, you know, behind every good man is a, is a better woman, um, that's absolutely true. You nailed it. She, she's yeah. a better person than I am, I yeah. know for a doubt. I, I know she has to put up with a lot, because I have to look at my face in the mirror every morning and just kind of shake my head. <laughs> what was she thinking? Yeah, what was she thinking? What the hell were you looking at when you saw me? Well, there's something. We've been having a great time with Ernie, and there's a lot of great takeaways. Uh, we've, we've learned about all the different variations in the knife designs that can be tailored to the individual user. Uh, and also the creative flow in which he's able to take, you know, a couple of winning designs and creating a hybrid. Uh, more importantly is the, the focus on family in not just a small business, 
but developing a much larger business. And he's got a great support system that we can all learn from. In our next video, we're going to talk about the importance of Ernie's background in martial arts and more importantly, how the Code of the Warrior has really created the guiding principles in the success of his business at Emerson Knives. I'm Ed Thorell from Firearms Education and Training and on behalf of Shoot of the Series. We'd sure like to thank everybody for tuning in. So don't be afraid to subscribe as well as like and share so you can tune into more of these videos when we put them out there. Y'all take care.